happy almost New Year's. Uh, I don't know if I can actually stay until 12 midnight. Uh, I'm a little old, and so I get really tired. So, but if I don't see you, happy New Year. Hey, uh, you know, uh, you know, Helen um, picked a song. Uh, I could sing of your love forever. Um, and as she, as I saw those words, um, it brought me back to the past. Uh, when when I used to, uh, some of you guys, some of you guys uh, will remember this too. Uh, in the past, when um, praise was a little more simple, where even I could lead it <laughs> with my little simple guitar, and I remember uh, singing that song, I could sing of your love forever. And at times, um, getting so caught up with it, um, I kept on singing that, that phrase again and again and again, uh, I can sing of your love forever. <laughs> and it brought me to the, the youth group days where, not when I was a youth group member, but when I was leading a youth group, when I was a youth uh, director. Uh, we were, I was in a Korean church, and I remember every New Year's Eve, we would have service. Um, and I would, you know, gather all the youth group kids, and we would go into the, quote, the main service, uh, where the parents um, would, would have service, and it would be all in Korean. And most of the kids would be all confused, me, half-half. <laughs> I'm okay in Korean, but some of those words uh, in the sermon was hard. And it was, and they would always have it at 1230 um, I'm sorry, not 12.30, 11.30, sorry. They would always have the service at 11.30. Not at 9, not at 8, not at 10, but they would always have it at 11.30. And as the service is going on, uh, you know, I don't, at, in the middle of, you know, they would sing, we would sing hymns, and then the pastor would go up, and, and he would give his message. And I remember all the, the youth group kids were always kind of looking at their watch a little bit <laughs> to see when that midnight would strike. Um, and so, but the pastor would just preach, right? He would preach. And I don't know if it was for some other Korean churches, uh, but I know in my church, um, the, the senior pastor would have that, that, you know, that little bell that some teachers have, elementary teachers have to tell everyone to be quiet. So he would have that right on his pulpit. And I, I think there was a clock right up there. When it became 12, he would just go and he would just go, ding. And then he would just continue with the sermon like nothing ever happened. <laughs> it was like the oddest thing. And all the kids who were just wanting to celebrate New Year's, and they were, you know, they were all like, hey, happy New Year. <laughs> all upstairs, of course, never downstairs, <laughs> upstairs and just kind of, uh, you know, talking with one another. Uh, but, you know, New Year's Eve, um, that's what we do. We kind of look at the past. We kind of look at the past. And as believers, we look at the past and see what, what Christ has done for us, how Christ was with us, um, and the times that we felt alone times that we felt blessed, uh, times that we felt like, God, why aren't you here? The frustrating times. And so that's what we do during New Year's Eve. And, but, and we, we do that, but we also look at the, the present. So New Year's Eve is not only about looking at the past and seeing what God did or what you did in the past year, but it's also about present, about coming together like this and celebrating together. The, the coming of the new year. You know, we have the, you know, the countdown, everyone shouts Happy New Year's, and, and we have a celebration. But it's different if you're at home and, and you're just there by yourself and that midnight strikes and you want to celebrate, but you're by yourself. And it's different when you come here into a gathering and you celebrate. So New Year's Eve is not only about the past, but it's also about the present and what happens in the present. But also, it's about the future. It's about thinking of all the, maybe the mistakes that you made uh, in 2019 and wiping that all clean and saying, now I'm going to start brand new. You know, we call them New Year's resolutions. Uh, a lot of it has to do with health. Uh, a lot of it has to do about reading the Bible, praying more, being a witness. But we have certain goals that we look forward in the future in 2020 what I didn't do in 2019, I'm going to do in 2020. So today, we have everything. We have the whole timeline. We think about the past, we, we think about the present, and we think about the future. And what's more appropriate? In light of the past, the present, and the future, what's more appropriate than talking about communion? Because communion has a past relevance, has a present relevance, and a future relevance. 
you know, one of the good thing, great things about that service that I went to every single um, uh, New Year's in my current church was that we ended the year worshiping God. And the very first thing that we do did was worshiping God. Yeah, we did it continually, but the last thing that we did, 1159, we worshiped God. And 1201, we worshiped God. And it was all focused on God. And what this communion does, it helps us to focus on who God is, what he has done for us, what he's doing right now for us, and what he will do in the the future. So what I would like and invite you to uh, look at communion uh, in a deeper way today. You know, normally we would have communion every first Sunday uh, uh, of every month. And, you know, either myself or Pastor uh, Steve would come up and give maybe a minute or two kind of an instruction on what communion is, and we would have all the elders come up, and you guys would come, and you would take the the bread and wine or the bread and cup and go, and we would do it all together. What I'm going to do is, I'm not going to give a message per se, but I'm just going to extend communion. And I wanna, what I want to do is I want to talk about what communion is and the implications of taking communion. And then do communion together and pray together. And kind of end the year like that. Thinking about God uh, nourishing us and looking forward to the future when we will dine with him. Now, you might say there's not too much to talk about. Don't, you know, we come, we remember Jesus' death on the cross. We drink, we eat, and then we're done. But I feel like there's a lot more to it. You know, I know this is not uh, in the 1500s, but you've heard about people who stood up for their faith in the past as heroes, as martyrs, who stood up for the faith. They didn't, they, you know, about, with the Bible, with, with other things. What not too many people know is that this communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, there were so many people who actually died because they held the wrong belief. About communion. Those people who died took this and the meaning of this so seriously that they would rather die than think something else about what communion rather is, uh, um, as opposed to what God has to say. So I know that, you know, in, in now it's not, yeah, if we have the wrong view of communion, we're not going to be beheaded or we're not going to die. Somebody's not going to come. We have that freedom in this country. But I think we sometimes have uh, put the meaning of communion so low that it just becomes sometimes superficial. That's what John Piper says. That when we do communion, we come up and we just eat it, and then we're done. And it means absolutely nothing to us except that we did it. But just think about this. Just think about what Jesus said when he sat with his disciples. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. The specific act of the Lord's Supper, he said, do this. And when you do this, you will remember me. Tell me another passage. There may be one right here too, but tell me a passage where Jesus says, do this, and that will give you a picture of who I am, of what I've done. Yeah, there may be things that God commands us to do. Love one another. Go read the Bible and do all these things. But where does it say, when you do this specific thing, you will remember me. If as believers, we want to know him, we want to remember him, we should be grabbing, we should be going towards the thing when Jesus says, if you do this, you will remember me the most. And that's what communion is. So a few things about communion, some basic meaning. It's one of two sacraments in the Bible. The first is baptism, and the other is the Lord's Supper, this. You know, and we, a lot of times we celebrate baptism a lot, uh, not only at our church. We elevate those who are, you know, baptized, and we celebrate those Sundays. Uh, not only at this church, but other churches, they celebrate it. Uh, they, you know, and, and it has a lot of meaning, and we give, you know, flowers, we take pictures, And that's good, and that's appropriate. But how many times do we take the Lord's communion and walk out and get flowers and take pictures? 
Because baptism and the Lord's Supper are the same. They're two sacraments where Jesus says, do these two things. Baptism is that initial symbolism of the entrance into the kingdom of God. The Lord's Supper is a continual fellowship that we have with Christ. Yes, baptism, we only do it once because it tells us you come in, you're good. But once you come in, as much as we celebrate baptism, the Lord's Supper, sometimes we need to celebrate it as much. Because it's a continual reminder that we have fellowship with God. That what happened at baptism is continual. So it's those two sacraments that we celebrate. One, baptism, and the Lord's Supper. The second, it is a means of grace. I know that may be a word... Uh, um, may be a little unfamiliar to, uh, to most, but it's a means of, of grace. Uh, and what I'm going to explain this a little bit more, but it's a little bit more than, communion is a little bit more than just remembering what Christ has done. It's actually a means by which Christ uses or God uses to pour blessing upon us. It is not something that happens automatically that you don't care, you just kind of walk up, you take that little piece of bread and you eat it, oh, I'm filled with, you know, blessing and grace. That's not exactly how it goes because you have to do it with faith. You have to do it with a knowledge that, that God is your Savior. But God uses this communion here as one of the means of grace. And if we want more grace in our lives, if we want more blessing in our lives, by faith we come and do this. So it's a means of grace uh, next is, it is a covenant meal. So one of the things that, that we um, think of, of when we talk about, the, you know, we talk communion, we don't actually say supper, the Lord's Supper. It sounds kind of uh, outdated. We say communion, and we say, well, it's not really feeding us. It's a little piece of cracker, <laughs> a little grape juice. But I think according to the Bible, this is actually a feast. It came out of the, the Passover meal. But what is interesting is when you look at the Bible, there's a lot of people that sit down and eat. Uh, there's a lot of stories of it. You know, when you think of eating, it's just, you know, you eat and you go and you do something important. Eating is something you have to do. But when you look at the, the Bible, there's a lot of eating time. There's a lot of feasts. It's not just that the old people or the Jewish people, they love food. I'm sure they do. But it had a significance of eating. Because the, the meals that are talked about a lot in the Old Testament are what we call covenant meals. It's a covenant meals. And it's, it's like this. If you had a fight with one of your friends, I mean, a real, you know, a, a big fight with one of your friends or somebody you hated, okay, and you were at odds with that person, and you were just yelling, and, and, and after a while, you kind of try to make up a little bit and say, you know, it's okay, my fault, your fault, my bad, all that stuff, you make up, Okay. Now, after that incident, you could kind of walk away and say, oh, I still hate this guy. <laughs> but you said it, right? You kind of reconciled, but not really in your heart. You walked away. Try this if you ever get into a fight with, with somebody, okay? Once you reconcile with that person, go and have a meal with them. If you go have a, have a meal with them and you sit down face to face and you are talking kind of when you know that it's all good. Think about it. Because meals are, 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 are things that, that's, that, that binds people together a lot. You know, except when you're on your phones. But take out the phones out, and you're, you're sitting there, you're eating, and you know how it's awkward if you don't talk? But what happens in a meal? You sit down and you start talking. You converse. You communicate. You have communion. And a lot of times in the Old Testament, when people were fighting or they were making treaties, what they would do is to ratify that treatment, a treatment, that, that treaty is they would come together and they would eat a meal. They would eat a big feast. And that certify that the treaty was confirmed or the argument that you had with that person was no more. It was a covenant meal and that you can see that in the Old Testament again and again. You see it in that book, you know, Noah. When Noah, after God flooded the world, Noah comes out 
He does the altar, but he kills an animal. You know what he did? He does? He eats. He has a feast. What happens with the, with the book of Exodus? When God finally takes him out of the land to celebrate that, God creates the Passover meal. You see, what this represents here is a covenant meal. Meaning that there, was a, there were odds, that somebody was in odds with another person. And if you think about it, it's Christ had a problem with us. God had a problem with us. And what this symbolizes when you come together and eat is that that friction, it's been reconciled. And you're dining with Christ. That's what this thing represents. It is a covenant meal that God's salvation is so deep and so complete that he can sit with us and eat with us. Remember Isaiah when he came before God and he came into the presence of God, just in the presence of God. He says, woe is me. I am undone. Because me, a sinner, in the same presence as God, the Holy One, that cannot be. But yet, we're not only in the presence, but we're actually eating a meal with him. God's salvation, God's reconciliation through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection is deep and complete. So it is a covenant meal. And so it is a means of grace, it is a covenant meal, and it's one of those things that God has instituted. Now, he didn't, so now we're going to go into what he actually did that day when he actually instituted. And so if we can open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 22, verse 14. It's, it's wrong on the, uh, on the bulletin, that was my fault. I gave uh, the same story, but the wrong gospel. So I gave you the Matthew, but... Um, But it's Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. So knowing what baptism is, Jesus comes and and gives uh, this instruction to his disciples when he met them in the upper room. And verse 14 says, And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, uh, he said, take this and divide it amongst yourself. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup... After you have eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. So as I said in the, in the beginning, if Jesus says, I'm going to institute something and do this because it will remind you of me. I think as believers, we need to really take heart. But we got to be careful of what this remembrance means when he says, do this in remembrance of me. Um, One of the things that when you look at the New Testament and the Old Testament, the word remembrance comes out. uh, And in the context of of the covenant, uh, when the word remembrance means, it usually just goes actually to God rather than to his people. So the, the rainbow, the covenant rainbow. That's our reminder uh, that, that, you know, God will never destroy the world again uh, with a flood. But if you look at the text, you know, more closely, it's actually God remembering his covenant. He says, I will, when I see the rainbow, I will see. I will see the covenant that I made. When we do, when we're, when we're taking communion and we're taking to our, you know, do this in remembrance of me, the first person that remembers is God the Father. As we come and, and take the bread and wine, 
Not that he forgets, but he says, I remember my covenant that I made with you. And I'm going to pour out my blessing with you. Now, and for also, but also for us, we come in remembrance. But the word remember um, has a meaning of, you know, um, you know, there's something in the past, something that happened, and I'm going to remember that thing that happened. And that's kind of our definition of remembrance. In the past, Christ died for us on the cross, so I'm just going to remember it. But I think it's a little bit more than that. Um, I think what, um, and I'll give you a silly illustration. Um, my, my wife and I, um, I remember, uh, and I don't know if she remembers, but I, th- as, as clear as it happened like yesterday, I remember the, our first kind of fight. I do. And it was something, over, something stupid, okay? And I remember, uh, I, and I don't know, it might have been a week after we got married, or a couple of weeks after, first week we went to honeymoon. Second week uh, we came, and I remember uh, that I, um, I wore this one shirt, okay, I wore the, and I'm not sure if I wore it, I, so I just, and, and I, I remember I, I, I took it off the next day, or the night, and then, and I put that in the hamper, because I was going to wash it, and my wife said, what are you doing? You only wore it once. You don't wash shirts after you wore it once, because no, it's dirty. I, I'm a guy, I sweat more, <laughs> so I need to wash it, so I remember throwing it into the, the, the washer. And I don't know if this is exactly what happened, but this is, it's so traumatic that I, I, I remember it this way. I remember she, she took it out of there, and she threw it into the, the drawer. I was like, what do, I, what do I do? Do I get into a huge major fight over this shirt? Uh, and I had a hard time because I can't wear shirts twi- two days in a row. It, it feels, I feel dirty when I wear it, and guys understand this. Okay? And I feel dirty, and so I really wanted to wash it. So do I just lie? And sneak it in there when she's not watching? What, what do I do? And I, but I did try it one time. I remember trying wearing a shirt twice, and I couldn't stand it. <laughs> I took it off. And so you know what the solution was? I started doing the laundry myself. <laughs> and so I do it. But, even, but th- th- and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story, right, that happened many, many years ago. But I remember it. But not only do I m- remember it, but I, sometimes it comes to me. When I'm washing clothes, <laughs> should I wash this or not? It affects me <laughs> a certain way. And I think that's the type of remembrance, remembrance that I think um, that we should have with communion. It's not just remembering, but to remembering so that it will affect us in the present. It's not just a fact that we know. But it is something that affects us here and now. Something that happened in the past affects us. Maybe for you guys, some of you guys, it might be some person saying a particular word or a word of wisdom, and you just can't get it out of your system. And whenever you think about that, it makes you act a different way. That's what communion is. It's not just remembering. It's a means of grace where God blesses us, convicts us of what he did so that it will change us in the present and it will change us in the future. Whenever we walk out and after communion, we should go out changed. We should be convicted to do something for God. We should be thankful in our hearts that Christ did this for me. We don't just walk out of communion and say, okay, we did it, and that was it. The communion for you was just a fact, was just something that you remember. No, remembering affects us. And the Jewish people understood this. Whenever they looked, in, in, whenever they, in the Old Testament, when you look at especially Psalms, they would say, look in the past. Look how God redeemed you. But they always, after they said that, it goes, now God will redeem you now. That thing in the past is connected to the, the present. <coughs> So do this in remembrance of me is much more than a memorial. It is not jumpy uh, recollecting what Christ has done. It's so much more. It's a means by which you are trained, uh, trained into serving him. So those are the basic things about communion. Now, as you take communion, 
as New Year's, we look at the past, the present, and the future, and I kind of alluded to that, but let's get a little more specific about the past, present, and future as we take communion. How does communion tell us something about the past? Uh, and this is the most simple thing, right? Communion reminds us of Christ's death on the cross. The body, the bread symbolizing the broken body of Christ for us, and the cup or the grape juice um, that we drink symbolizing the, the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And in that way, God established a new covenant. So that's something that I don't think I need to preach on. Not that because it isn't important, but I think many people understand that that's what this thing is. That this is the, the, the broken body and the, and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So that's the past. So it reminds us of the past. But remember, the past has to affect our, uh, our present. So how does it affect our uh, present? So the first thing that we got to recognize is that when we take communion, the host is not me. I'm not the one telling you to come and eat. Okay? I speak for somebody else when I do that. The host is Jesus. The host is God. That's how it was in the first Passover. It was Jesus who was the host of the table. It was Jesus that said, come. It was Jesus that broke the bread and gave it to his disciples or passed the cup around. It was Jesus who spoke and explained what the, the gospel is. In the present, people, as you come and eat, you know, in, in older traditions, the priests would come down. And I remember when I went to Europe and I went to a, a church in Europe, they still did this. As people would come down, there would be a bar like this. And this was a regular Protestant church. And what the priest would do is he would actually break, well, at that time, he would just break the bread off. And then I had to actually come. It was really weird. I actually came, and I just opened my mouth. It's like a little baby. <laughs> and he put it in my mouth. It was really odd. <laughs> but, you know, because it would be odd if I took one and he came, and it, just, it would take forever. Right? If I put that all in your mouth. But that's kind of the point. Jesus is feeding you. Jesus is nourishing you. He says, this is my body. Take and feed from me. And as you take, yes, it is your hand. And some, it is your hand that takes it. And it is your hand that puts it in your mouth. But spiritually, Jesus is the one that's hosting. And Jesus is the one that's feeding. He's saying, look at this broken body. This is what burdens what I did for you. This is what I did for you. So in, 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 a, in a few minutes, as you come up, and you will take it. We're not going to have elders do it here today. You're going to take it and eat. But in your mind, think, Jesus is feeding me. <laughs> Jesus is giving me the food that I need. Jesus is giving me the gospel that I need. He's giving me the grace that I need. So he is... <coughs> feeding you. And as he's feeding you, there is communion with him that happens. You are united with him. I don't, I don't know about you, but one of the, you know, the beautiful things um, is, is when you're feeding a child, and I don't know if you, you know, when you're feeding a child and that child, a baby, more of a baby, is sitting in that you know, high chair, and you get that gross food, okay, that, the baby food, and the baby opens their mouth, it's really cute, and you put that in there, it, it's, I don't know why, I, maybe it's just me, but I think that's just awesome, <laughs> just seeing it. And the expression as is eating and is feeding, and you almost want to think about it in, in that way, that it's a beautiful picture of Christ feeding you. <laughs> so he is feeding you. But there's also a, a communion aspect to it in terms of each other. You know, one of the things that I, I really try to do when, when I do lead communion is I ask you guys to wait. After you grab it, wait until everyone has it so we can all take it together, symbolizing our unity in Christ. Um, because, I, you know, at, at times when, when I've seen other uh, people do it, not at our church, but other places that I experience is, we all, they all kind of came and kind of randomly took it and then, they took off and all that stuff. And I feel like that wasn't unifying. It wasn't symbolizing our communion with each other. So when we come, 
not only as individuals, but as together we are all feeding on Christ as a church. And so we not only have communion with Christ, but we have communion with each other. And there is one other thing um, that, that happens in the present is um, sometimes uh, preachers would say, sometimes I would say, sometimes I would not. But, you know, in 1 Corinthians, um, there's a weird little story or happening where people were getting sick and, and, you know, Paul was saying, make sure you examine yourself before you take communion, before you take Lord's Supper. And so this is actually another time where we kind of reflect on our past a little bit and see how, many, how, how sinful we are. We need to examine ourselves. And what we need to do is we need to get rid of the sin. I remember the big mistake that I made when I did like my first communion and, and another pastor who was, who was older than me said, what, what are you saying? I, I basically told them, if you have any sin in your heart, don't eat. <laughs> okay, don't eat because you're a sinful man and you don't deserve. I almost said it like that. I was like, I don't know why I said that. And I think people, as they were coming, they felt all guilty <laughs> as they were eating. And another pastor of mine sat me down and goes, well, you're reading that text a little wrong. <laughs> you know, what you want to tell people is they know that they're sinners. And you can tell them that they're sinners. But you need to tell them to repent and then come in communion. <laughs> when you come, you, you see the, this thing set up. And you know if this is talking about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for your sins. And if you have any sins in your heart, you want to get rid of that by asking God for forgiveness. Then take communion. That's why one, that's why one, one thing that we always say before communion is, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, don't come up. Don't come up and take communion. Because if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ or you're an unrepentant sinner, this will condemn you. It will not bless you. It will condemn you. It will represent your sin more than God's grace. And so you need to examine yourself in the present. But know that you have forgiveness. As you look more into it, as you think about, man, I'm a sinner. I shouldn't take communion. I can't be with God. But God, look at this. God has died for me. Now I just ask for forgiveness. Now I'm clean before God. Now I'm going to come and eat with him. It's kind of like that. So today I am going to ask you to kind of examine your heart a little bit before we take communion. And so that's the present. But it's also talking about the future. Okay. You know, there is in the book of Revelations, there's an image of a great banquet that, that we take, that we'll have with Jesus Christ. When all things are done, one of the first things that's going to happen is God's going to gather all of us, and he's going to share a meal with us. And it's going to be a great feast. So now, this also gives us hope. You know, we eat... Um, these little crackers, and I'm not sure if this is wrong, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to take one right now. I'm not going to eat it, okay? But you take one of these things, okay, and you eat it, right? Are you going to be satisfied if you're hungry? If you're hungry right now, are you waiting for you to come up so you can eat one of these things? And after you eat one little cracker, that you're, you're, you're going to be so full that, that you're satisfied. And you say, oh, God is good. He's feeding me uh, physically too. No, of course not, okay? But what this represents is the now, okay? The future is going to be much better than this. This is a glimpse of what we will eat with Christ. When all things has come to pass, we will not dine with him with crackers, because we will not be in our lowly physical bodies. We will have glorious bodies. And with those glorious bodies, we will have a feast like none other. To ratify and complete the salvation that Christ has promised us. When we eat this, this is not enough. You hope and you're glad that in the future, you will dine with him in a much greater way. That this life is not it. This is not all we have. But there is a future for us with Christ. 
that is infinitely, almost infinitely greater. So not only do we look at the past as we take communion, not only do we look at the present as we see that he is nourishing us and we need to examine our bodies, examine and, and, that, and get rid of those sins by asking him for forgiveness, but as we eat, we also think about the future of how great this great feast will be. Just like New Year's Eve has a past, present, and future, <coughs> communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, has a pre past, present, and future. So this is not everything that I wanted to say, because there's more to communion uh, than, uh, than what I've said. But what I did want to say Just like this little piece, don't make communion this anymore. Don't make communion something of just, I eat it, gone, eh, that's fine. I did it, nothing big. No, make communion greater next year or even today. Make it a means of grace where you come, you seek forgiveness, and you receive it. Think about what Christ has done on that cross. Think about the present as he's nourishing you, telling you that he loves you. That's why he did this. And always think about the future when you will have this great meal with him. So what I want to do is take communion. But I, wanna, I don't know if I want to do it a different way because uh, it's communion, communion. We're not going to have elders, like I said, in the front. I'm going to ask the, um, the, the praising to come up.